So today, I just wanted to, uh, you know, again, like Amit said, talk a little bit about biopsies, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about BRAF and this whole notion of targeted therapies. And I wanted to really kind of stress that we can really kind of unlock the mysteries of responses, not only to BRAF targeted therapy, but also to immunotherapy. And the way we can do that is by doing biopsies. So let me just show you. Um, it's great to be back in LA, first of all. I uh, did part of my training here um, up at UCLA, and so I lived in LA for about two years. I actually lived in Santa Monica and uh, ran back to go and watch the sunset every day, so it's uh, very nostalgic for me to be back. You know, I spent a lot of time in Boston, I'm now in Houston, so I'm slowly inching my way back to LA. So stay tuned. A couple of years, you may just see me here. Okay, so, um, you know, I work now at MD Anderson Cancer Center and, and uh, in, in surgical oncology and also in genomic medicine. And, and kind of really what I hope to bring to you today is that we can use tools, you know, to help understand why these treatments either work or don't work and how to make them better. And so, you know, this was the cover from Time Magazine in April of 2013, and it talked about how we can really cure cancer, and how can we do that? And it's by establishing these so-called dream teams. And there have been two major advances, as everyone knows in this audience, with regard to melanoma, and that is in two areas. One is with targeted therapy, and then the other is with immunotherapy. Now, what exactly is targeted therapy? Well, basically, we know that cancer is a disease of DNA, okay? And genetic mutations can result in the development of cancer. And so these genetic mutations can cause, you know, can lead to increased growth and spread of tumors. And by targeting these mutations, we can actually stop cancer cells from growing and spreading. And we may even kill the cancer cells. And, you know, one thing that I'll talk a lot about today is kind of that, that whole BRAF gene. And so this is, you know, you'll see kind of, I have little cartoons to show you what are the genetic changes that occur. You know, this basically is a cell. These are all different, uh, you know, genes essentially within the cell. And you can see that within the past decade, there have been huge advances in identifying these different genetic mutations that occur that lead to melanoma. One of the most common of these is in this BRAF gene. So you can see that in over half of melanomas, there's actually a mutation in this gene. And what happens when you get a mutation in this gene is you actually get essentially a short circuit in the cell. And so basically, normally, you know, not much is happening here. When you get a mutation, all of a sudden, short circuit, this drives down this pathway and you get several deleterious things. You get uncontrolled growth of the, mel of the melanoma. You get resistance to killing or to cell death. You also can, the melanoma can grow new blood vessels for itself, essentially nourish itself. And then it also, interestingly, you know, by having this mutation, can, this actually makes it invisible to the immune system. So these, you know, thus targeted therapy can actually intersect with immunotherapy. And I'll show you a little bit of why we think that happens. And so, you know, again, there have been huge advances with regard to targeted therapy. So by knowing that this mutation existed and that by then, you know, pharmaceutical companies coming up with drugs that target this, this actual mutation, we can actually stop the tumor in its tracks. We can stop all these deleterious effects. And, you know, this really represents one of the most phenomenal advances, you know, in the treatment of melanoma in decades, where, you know, when you treat patients with a BRAF inhibitor, you can actually get really rapid shrinkage of tumors. And on the left here, you can see this is a, a PET scan of a patient here. And you can see that all these black dots here, you know, are essentially melanoma tumors. But then when you treat with a BRAF inhibitor, all of a sudden those all go away. This is uh, normal brain activity that's, that's just excreted in the bladder, so that's all normal. But, you know, really most of these tumors actually have completely been shut down. And this, you, you saw a uh, waterfall plot just in the last talk, and you know, again, basically this is, you know, kind of uh, what we use to look for, you know, for each individual bar represents a patient. And what you can see is that uh, the, that zero there means, you know, if there's bars above zero, it means that the tumor grew. If there's bars below zero, it means that the tumor shrank. And you can see in the vast majority of people there that were treated with a BRAF inhibitor, their tumor shrank. Some of them actually went completely away over on this side. But the problem with this is, you know, there is a hitch, right? And that hitch is that 
even though you get regression of tumors in the majority of patients, the tumors most often grow back, and it usually happens within six months. And so here you can see that before treatment in this red circle here, there's a tumor within the abdomen, actually in the pancreas there. You give a BRAF inhibitor, that tumor shrinks, but within a couple of weeks after starting that drug, you know, the tumor comes back. And so, you know, really we as doctors and scientists and, you know, people in the melanoma community really wanted to know what's going on here. Why are these tumors responding? But then why do they grow again? And so, you know, we turned to our patients to help us answer that question, okay? And so when patients who were coming in to see us were being treated on these, with these medicines, what we did is we, we approached them. We said, you know, would you mind enrolling on this uh, this research protocol so that we can actually get blood and take a little tiny piece of that tumor before you start the medicine, about a week or two after you start the medicine, and then if the tumor regrows. You know, can we do that? And thankfully, there were patients who were willing to do that. Uh, we did that, you know, and got blood and tumor biopsies at that time. And then what we did is we checked those tumors for genetic changes. Uh, within the tumor itself and also checked the blood and the tumor for, uh, you know, essentially those immune cells, those T warrior cells that you heard about earlier. And basically, very busy slide, don't focus on it too much, but all these red, you know, circles are, are all different genetic mutations. So, you know, like you, like you heard before, you know, you, you block one pathway and another one pops up. It's like whack-a-mole, you know, so we were able to identify you know, potential areas, you know, where these pathways are getting reactivated, but also potential opportunities to block this. And, you know, like you said, in combination, can use two drugs instead of one. And in addition to that, we found something really, really interesting. You know, we had a hunch when we were starting these that the immune system may actually be contributing to the response to these drugs. And, you know, so we looked at the tumors before we started the medicine, and what we found is that, you know, these tumors were essentially completely hidden to the immune system. There were no proteins on the surface, you know, you saw that from the talk before, um, and there were no T cells. None of the warrior cells were actually in the tumor. Well, you treat with the BRAF inhibitor, and within two weeks of starting that medicine, all of a sudden, those tumors unmask themselves, they decloak, you know, they essentially make themselves visible, and on top of that, perhaps more impressively, is you get this dense infiltration of these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, the same ones that you heard about that can be taken out of the tumor and grown up. And so it seems that the immune system may help the body destroy these tumors that are treated with BRF inhibitors. But again, there's a hitch. And what can happen is that tumor is smart. You know, we've heard before that these tumors adapt, and so the tumor can actually start making proteins that shut down the immune system. And again, this happens with the, within about two weeks of starting that, that medicine. And so, you know, my, the question posed to me today, how can we unlock the mysteries of response to therapy? Not only targeted therapy, but immunotherapy. And what I'd stress to you is that the key to understanding this and to what is happening in the tumor itself is by doing biopsies. And so, you know, again, just to kind of uh, go through what we talked about before, with targeted therapy, the majority of patients who get targeted therapy, their tumors either shrink or go away, uh, but the effect's not long-lasting. And furthermore, we're doing studies to understand why melanomas become resistant, and a lot of what we've learned has been by looking at these tumors over the course of time. In addition to that, immunotherapy, you've heard tremendous responses. We, we see tremendous responses every day to this. And we do see dramatic responses, but it doesn't work in all patients. Uh, and we're doing studies to understand why some people respond, other people don't. And then we're learning this again by doing these biopsies. And then finally, we're also trying to learn, I think something that's incredibly interesting and profound, is that we're trying to understand why tumors sometimes shrink but don't go away. You know, sometimes you can actually just hold a tumor in check forever, and so be it, you know? Uh, so how do we do the biopsies? It's actually pretty straightforward. You know, I do these in my clinic all the time. Uh, there's a couple different types of biopsies that we do. This is, um, you, you saw a picture earlier with, you know, with tumors that were on the skin, and this is so-called in transit melanoma. And basically what we can do is we can actually take a biopsy of one of those tumors, and we essentially use this, what's called a punch biopsy. 
uh, instrument, and it's like a little cookie cutter, you know, I tell my patients. And then when we get that, uh, that tumor out, what we can do is look under the microscope, and here in the red circle, you can see those are tumor cells, okay? Uh, this, you know, sometimes they're deeper, right? You know, so sometimes they're right on the surface of the skin, sometimes they're a little bit deeper. This is one of my patients who had a, a, a lymph node underneath, you know, in the neck, kind of right up above the clavicle or the collarbone. And what we did is I actually used an ultrasound right in clinic to get a picture of that tumor. And here you can see what it looks like on the ultrasound. And then I was able to use this something called a core biopsy instrument here and actually do a core biopsy right in the clinic, you know, with a teeny tiny little nick in the skin and was able to get, you know, a little piece of that tumor out, which again, looked under the microscope and you see, you know, that we have those tumor cells. Now, sometimes they're even deeper. And then, you know, again, this is a very collaborative field. We need to include, you know, medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, radiation oncologists. We need to include our radiologists who are actually uh, able to help us get some of these biopsies to really find out what's going on in these tumors. And so this is one that's in the liver. Here you can see a patient on a CAT scanner. And basically what they can do is they can actually use that CAT scanner to help get that biopsy done and to do it quite safely. Again, they use essentially the same core biopsy instrument that I use in the clinic. And, you know, here I show you uh, normal liver on the left. There's melanoma tumor over on that right-hand side. So what do we do on these? And you started to get a hint of, you know, like what types of things we look at when we look at these tumors. So we want to know why people are responding, why they're not responding, and how we can make responses better. And so to do that, we do a couple of things. So, you know, first we want to look at you know, what's going on within the tumor with these signaling pathways and also with the genetic mutations. You know, what little pathway cropped up when we knocked one down. And we can do that, you know, partially by actually taking the DNA out and isolating the DNA, you know, and then you can actually, this is what it looks like, but then, you know, what it, what's really important to you is that we get this report back, which gives us a list of what mutations are actually in that tumor. Um, and in addition to that, we can also, again, look at, you know, you saw some protein analysis. We can do that on the tumors as well. And then another critical part of this is that, you know, we are also looking at the immune system within these tumors. You know, what T cells are present inside the tumor, and then what can we do to make those T cells work better? And so, you know, I pose the question to all of us, you know, can these studies help patients with melanoma? And emphatically, I can say they already have. You know, we've actually already made strides in treatment because of these findings. And, you know, research into these genetic changes and the immune changes have already led to advances. And so what are some of these advances? And so I'll just give you two uh, examples of this. The first one is, you know, I showed you that, you know, this short circuit in the cell, you know, the BRAF mutation can be blocked by treating with a BRAF inhibitor. You know, the ones that are out there uh, include bemurafenib and dibrafenib. But what happens? And like I told you, within six months, a lot of these tumors start regrowing. Why? Well, when we actually looked at the genetic mutations that occur in these, you can sometimes get a mutation in this, in this little thing called MEC, which is just downstream of that BRAF. And when you get that, it leads to the same short circuit and the same bad problems that are associated with the BRAF mutation. So what happens is then you can come in and add another medicine. We talked about combinations. It's really the future. And you can actually knock it down again. And so that actually, those are now being used in patients. And so, you know, you have, you know, BRAF inhibitors that you can treat with, but you can also treat with a BRAF inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor right at the outset. So real-time advances. Now, have we made strides with regard to understanding the immune response? And I can tell you absolutely yes. Um, I'll give you an example here. Again, you know, when you have this BRAF mutation, it actually causes the tumor cells to hide from the immune system. And it does so by kind of stripping off all the proteins on the surface which allow them to be recognized. And what happens when you treat with a BRAF inhibitor is you can actually unmask this tumor cell. And all of a sudden, it, be, it lights up like a Christmas tree. It's essentially, you know, a beacon for these T cells. But the problem is, is that the T cells, and you saw some of the pictures, there aren't that many T cells in the tumor. But if you can then come on top of this, you give a BRF inhibitor first, 
you add some form of immunotherapy, like ipilimumab, anti-PD-L1, anti-PD-1, you can get completely annihilate those tumors by attracting more T cells in and, and stimulating them. And so, again, this is happening in patients, okay? We, uh, there's combinations of BRF inhibitors and immunotherapy. Now in clinical trials, they show some promise. And so, you know, I pose to all of us, you know, what can we learn from doing more biopsies, you know? Can we learn anything else? And what I can tell you is we can learn why treatments are working, why they're not working, and how we can make them better. And I show you an example. This is a patient of ours that we treated with that combination of uh, BRAF targeted therapy and immunotherapy. And I'll just walk you through. These are the, those uh, killer T cells or the, the warriors. And you can see before he was treated with a BRAF inhibitor, he essentially had zero T cells. He had no T cells in his tumor. You treat with a BRAF inhibitor and he gets this dense influx. So all those T cells come in, but they're gone within a month. You know, so somehow they got shut down again. But we give him immunotherapy, you know, and we, un, you know, we essentially unleash the T cells and they come back and they come back in full force for many months. This was actually several months later and he had a great response to this treatment. And so, you know, just to kind of wrap it up, we're almost near the break. I have two or three more slides, so hang in there. But, you know, I, what I wanted to say is, okay, you know, for you, you know, when is my doctor going to ask me if I'm willing to have a biopsy? And there's two basic scenarios here. One is for what we call clinical indications, meaning that, you know, there's, we need to diagnose an abnormal area, either from, you know, we feel a lump or, you know, on a scan we see something that looks a little funny. We say, okay, we need to do a biopsy in order to see is that melanoma. And then the other scenario is that, you know, a lot of these, we, you know, like, you know, Dr. Hamid said, you know, we kind of missed the boat on some earlier trials because we didn't get these biopsies. Now we're smarter and we say, okay, we need to understand what's going on in the tumor. So when we're starting, you know, these clinical trials will actually mandate a biopsy. And, you know, it may seem like a headache, a hassle. It's actually good for you. You know, it's, you know, I can tell you that I would demand a biopsy, you know, because I want to know that, you know, if I get this treatment and it works really well, I want to know why. And if it doesn't, I want to know what I can do to make it better. And so then there's another critically important part, okay, and that's by, you know, to do research. So we can do these for clinical indications, but another critically important area is research, because the only way we advance the field is through research. And so the ultimate goal here is to cure all patients, and research really is critical to this. And really, you can help other people. You can help eternity, you know, by, by allowing research on these biopsies. And so we're doing this in the context, you know, I, I was at Harvard, I'm now at MD Anderson, inching my way back across the country. But uh, while I'm at uh, MD Anderson, you know, I'm working within this so-called Melanoma Moonshot program, which is a, a program with a, a goal of really uh, ending cancer and several different cancer types, melanoma is one of them. But what I'd like to stress is, you know, it's going on worldwide. It's, you know, it's going on here at the Angeles Clinic. It's going on at Memorial Sloan Kettering. It's going on at Genentech. It's, you know, it's, it's worldwide and we're all working together. And that's the way it should be done. And so, you know, again, we're working together to cure melanoma. All, all of you, you know, the doctors, the nurses, the scientists, and, you know, phenomenal organizations like AIM, we're all working together to make a difference here. Okay, so thank you very much.